This is a show that brings to the forefront newsmakers, entertainers, and those making a difference in our lives and in our world. Each week is a new adventure with topics ranging from the most serious and cutting edge to the most lighthearted and entertaining. This is Taking Care of Business with Richard Solomon. Greetings, everyone. Richard Solomon. I have an incredible show today. I have two phenomenal guests. I have Sifu, Richard Torres, um, of the martial art known as JKD or Jit Kudo, and they'll explain all of that, and Michael Millet. And they're going to talk a lot about um, uh, Bruce Lee and the, the art of JKD. And we're going to have, just have uh, just something that's very different for our show and, and, a, and a great, refreshing new approach to, I guess, something that in the public sphere may have some misconceptions. So, gentlemen, welcome. Uh, thank you so much thank for being you. with us today. Thank you, thank Richard. You. All right. So let, let's start off with a, a great quote. Uh, in pre-production, uh, Sifu, you were saying how there's a lot of Bruce Lee quotes, and, and there was one that you mentioned. Could you share that one with me? Uh, one of the quotes that Bruce Lee is known for is, be water, my friend. Okay, now, they, so tell us and, what, is, what is the essence of that? Well, the way he, he explains it, he, it, it starts with, if you put water into a cup, it becomes a cup. If you put it into a teapot, it becomes a teapot. Uh, the water can cool or it can crash. Be water, my friend, which means to be able to adapt to any situation. Flexibility and resilience, that's certainly, uh, in the modern time, uh, mm -hmm. a, a key component. So you are much of a student of Bruce Lee, is that correct? <laughs> yeah, I've been researching his whole life for since the 70s. So. All right. Where did that come from? What, what sparked? What sparked? Uh, I was introduced to Bruce Lee as a child watching the Green Hornet series when he played the role of Cato you know, the Green Hornet's assistant. And there, that's the first time I ever seen anyone do martial arts on the screen there. And and as a, and as a kid, you know, it basically blew me away. And But, uh, and then, you know, the series only lasted a year. It was in 1966. And, and, and it was canceled in 1967. And then I didn't hear anything about Bruce Lee until 19... 70, where he appeared in uh, Long Street. But in between there, I, I, I started uh, studying karate, and I started uh, doing some jiu-jitsu with my father, too. But but seeing Bruce Lee again in, in, uh, in a television series called Long Street, and in that television series, he started explaining his art of Jeet Kune Do, and it was amazing to see. Um, what I did was, when I found out that he was going to be in this Long Street series, I took my little portable television, which in those days uh, they did exist with batteries. And, uh, I, I had one. <laughs> yeah, it was very small, the little micro TV. <laughs> yeah, the, the screen was like an inch by an inch. Yeah. And, and, and I think it was black and white, right? Black and white. Yep. had an antenna. Yep. And I, and I devised, it had an earphone jack, and I devised a little uh, uh, wiring to... Uh, to uh, connect my microphone jack into the earphone jack of the TV. And um, I recorded the whole television series. I mean, the whole, uh, yeah, the, the TV episode on uh, cassette, uh, which was Long Street. And it was called, the name of the episode was called The Way of the Intercepting Fist, which is uh, Jeet Kune Do translated into English. And, is, is it, and the originating language is what language? Cantonese. Okay, Cantonese. Okay. Yeah. So, so I uh, little, you know, little did I know back in uh, 1970 or 71 that in the future we would have video tapes, video discs, and computers and all that. You know, so I thought you know recording him in an audio would be something amazing and to have, which which I still have that same cassette tape. I still have it, uh, and uh, and I would listen to what he had to say when he was teaching Long Street, which was a, a blind insurance man, and he was taking martial arts lessons from Bruce Lee. So that was that was the, the second time that I saw Bruce Lee on TV. Uh, and then 
after he did Lost, he actually went to Hong Kong and started filming the Chinese movies, uh, The Big Boss, Fist of Fury, and uh, I remember Fist of Fury. Yeah, yeah. And and w when these movies came out on uh, when when we had the big kung fu craze back in 1973, 72, 73, uh, Bruce Lee video Bruce Lee's movie excuse me were the number one hits they were really amazing to watch and and still to the at that time we we didn't even call him Bruce Lee yet we we called him Cato <laughs> you know <laughs> so we saw we were looking at Cato on, on uh in the movies there and and uh it was quite a shock to movies we there was nothing like that before and it was quite a shock for the American audience I mean so shocking that these movies would stay in the movie theaters like for a month they run the same movie over and over again. So oh. it was amazing to see. Now, so, this, so uh, yeah, yeah w w watching Bruce Lee in the movies was what, what got me into uh, trying to find out who he really was. So there was all these great movies coming out, and mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're watching, I guess, the explosion of the general acceptance of, of martial arts knowledge in the general public. And, and then I think in the 70s, didn't they have that song and everybody was kung fu fighting? Everybody was kung fu fighting. <laughs> yeah. There was a karate school in every corner. Yes. <laughs> um, and and yeah. you, were, you were studying all, all this material. Uh, and you, were taking, you said you were taking jujitsu? I was studying uh, karate first uh, in 71. And then I started uh, training in jujitsu with my father. And then when everybody was kung fu fighting, I started practicing some kung fu too with with some friends. So basically, uh, in a week in a week's time, I was doing karate, jujitsu, and kung fu all all in the so during the week. All right. So here's the question: If you're studying a particular art, mm -hmm. how do you discipline yourself not to let a move from a different art merge into what you're doing um, since they, since, you know, they, I'm sure they really weren't looking for fusion. <laughs> no, know? I think uh, uh, I, the way I was learning it, uh, they, they, they didn't, uh, they more complemented each other than, uh, than having a similarity. So there wasn't like a, you know, a uh, similarity of uh, punches or kicks or anything like that, but more like, you know, karate was one way, and then jujitsu was the had to do with 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 throwing and doing submissions, and then the kung fu had to do being you know uh, more deflecting and uh, learning to be uh, giving way to force instead of going against force. So there's so it they complemented each other. There's an expression, and I think. Uh, of people who read the Torah that to understand the Torah, you have to know all kinds of thought to understand the documents. Is that true here where by understanding all the different arts, the one that you're focusing on makes more sense? Is that possible? Actually, uh, the way it's taught in Jeet Kune Do is that if you understand the root, you understand the blossoming. Ah, that's, now, now let's talk a little bit about wisdom because um, I, re I remember a, a long time ago uh, in, a, uh, in a studio far away, I actually studied a little bit of uh, karate and, okay. I, and, I, and I studied a little judo too. And I remember that they made us read all kinds of um, ancient texts. And I remember uh -huh. the one that just seems to strike me that I remember was it was something like the tale of the golden shovel, and and the gist was sort of this guy was being put through a series of tests, and he had to go through like a maze, and then at the end of the maze, if he survived all these different challenges, he had to go into a room with all kinds of weapons, and the sign inside the room said, "You may only pick one," and he picked the shovel, and I guess because the shovel was dissimilar to all of the other, you know, uh, instruments. And apparently it was key because his decision was key to his ultimate success and survival. And it, was, it taught you about thinking and, and whatever. To, to what extent? Because we hear pearls of wisdom like to be like water. Um, if you, yeah. you know, understanding the root to understand the blossom, these kinds of things. 
to, mm -hmm. to what extent do you have to, to learn all of these, these deep thoughts and, and ancient wisdoms or time-tested wisdoms? Well, Bruce Lee was known for, for, for uh, uh, teaching philosophy with his art. So there's, there's, they're, they're, they basically you know, work together. That's why it's, it's, it, you know, once you understand the art, the philosophy, when you hear it, you can understand what he's trying to say and so forth. Yeah. Where, uh, actually, he uh, majored in philosophy in, uh, in the University of Washington. <laughs> oh, that's wild. So, and, uh, and he read a lot. He went beyond uh, what his uh, college taught him. And he read books on philosophy, Alan Watts and Krishnamurti and things like that. So, so he... I think I think he really enlightened himself by that self learning. You know, he always uh, he always emphasized self learning. You, you you never stop learning. You know, and self learning you continue to grow. Who and life is a God. like he says, life is a constant growing process. You know, and you're always learning. Who were his influences, and who taught him the foundational structures that ultimately became part of his core? I think um, as a youth, he wanted to be the best Kung Fu man. And Kung Fu is just Kung Fu, but it's in Cantonese, it's, they call it Kung Fu. Uh, uh, he wanted to be the best Kung Fu man he could be. So he started reading a lot of books. When he came to America, he started reading a lot of books on Kung Fu. He, uh, he lived in Seattle. And uh, he would drive to Vancouver, Canada, the Chinatown there, and buy books on uh and Kung Fu to try to expand his uh, knowledge of it. So so different from when he lived in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, he had no interest in books, and as soon as he came to America, books became something of uh, his his instructors almost, you know. But uh, he wanted to be the best Kung Fu man. And then and then uh, after that, he wanted to be uh, the best martial artist he could be. He wasn't, you know, because he, he started with the art called Wing Chun, Wing Chun Kung Fu. And uh, as and he and he really got up there uh, as far as his talent with with the art. So he wanted so that was that was one of his goals: be the best Wing Chun man. Then he wanted to be the best Kung Fu man. Then of course, he wanted to be the best martial artist he could be for himself. You know, when he and, grew uh, up, what was Hong Kong like for him? Was it was it um, street fighting uh, dangerous? Yeah, it was. It, uh, you know. Uh, he kept occupied by uh, make. Uh, he he made movies as a child. He was a child actor that kept him occupied. But when he wasn't making movie, he was in the streets there with his with his buddies, and uh, he would get into trouble. <laughs> so uh, uh, Hong Kong was very crowded at that time because a lot of people were coming from China and moving into Hong Kong to escape communism. And actually. One of the people that escaped uh, China was his was a uh, Yip Mang, which was uh, uh, which would become his uh, his Wing Chun instructor eventually when he was 13 years old because he wanted to study some type of martial art because he knew that if he like he 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 was quoted as saying if he didn't have his friends behind him, you know, how could he handle himself? And he he decided he better learn some martial arts. So. Uh, so at that time, yeah, he started studying martial arts for protection for, and be able to have the ability to protect himself if he had to. But he was, he had a lot of energy, you know. He, he would get himself into trouble a lot in Hong Kong to the point where I, I, he didn't even finish high school. He was in his senior year. I think he only had a few months to graduate, but he got into himself into some trouble and the parents just sent him to America. Now, you know, at, he, what age was this? 18. Okay. Because um, he was born in San Francisco. So he was an American citizen because he was born here in America, in San Francisco. So uh, so the idea was for him to finish high school in, uh, in Hong Kong and then return to America and, and go to enter a university there somewhere or college and, and continue his education in America. And better himself there. Now, in terms, but, of, uh, in terms of education, what was his path? 
obviously he wasn't going to become an accountant. <laughs> yeah, like, what, what, um, what, what, well, what, what was the direction he was sort of aiming for? Um, he, I have some letters that he was writing to people that he knew that were into medicine and he was asking them their opinion about it. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think he was looking to see, you know, of, of where he could be, you know, successful, you know, and, and what, you know, what he could do to be successful. And he was looking into medicine, but uh, one of the other avenues that he was really good at was dance, was dancing. He actually became the Hong Kong champion of cha-cha. <laughs> he was wow. crowned that. Yeah. So, and that was, just before he left to America, too. So, uh, so, so, uh, when he came, when he actually, when he got on the boat, the ship to come to America, when he got on the ship to come to America, he was teaching, you know, the cha cha dancing in the ship to the, the first class uh, people in the, in the ship. And, and he saw how he could make some money doing that. So, as soon as he got to San Francisco, he started teaching touch over there too so oh. it's funny because uh when he got there his godfather got him a job as a waiter <laughs> in a chinese restaurant <laughs> that didn't last too long though it, it goes to have... it goes to show you that you don't really know the where when you start the journey where you're going to end up but it's just important that the journey continues and it takes you where you need to go you know i think i think when you're when you're talented with something and you're not aware of, you know, that knowledge that you have because it's all around you where you originally live, but then you go somewhere else and you're like the only person that has this knowledge. It kind of makes you unique, you know, and that's what happened to him. I mean, I always say if somebody would have approached him to teach him how to dance and open up a studio, he probably would have gone, he would have uh, gone to that avenue and, and, and start teaching dance. But they approached him to teach martial arts, so that's what he did. I will, he became very good, very good at it. All right, we're going to take a quick break, but on the other side of the break, I want to ask, when did Bruce Lee actually figure out that he was so awesome? <laughs> we'll, we'll take that on the other side. This is Richard Solomon with uh, Sifu Richard Torres and Michael Malay, and we're talking about JKD and Bruce Lee, a lot of really cool stuff. Stay tuned. <laughs> All right, welcome back, everybody. Richard Solomon taking care of business. Check us out on YouTube, of course, and all kinds of other great podcast platforms. Uh, we're all there. We are with Sifu Richard Torres, uh, who is uh, with the martial art known as JKD, and Michael Malay, who is kind enough to actually arrange all of this. Uh, and he's, he's, he's quite special in many different realms, but, but today he's here with his sort of mastery of JKD with him. So we're talking a little bit about Bruce Lee, JKD, but now we're kind of getting to the question that I wanted to ask when the break was about to unfold, which was when did Bruce Lee realize that he was just this giant force in martial arts? When did it hit him? When, when did he realize he was like, oh, wow, it's like the Beatles of, of, of martial arts? Because he was, because he was entertaining. He was on, you know, in media, you know, he was, he was an explosive force, literally. I think I think um, when he when he moved to America, he didn't realize what he had as far as his knowledge was concerned. And then when he when he saw people approaching him to teach him, he uh, he realized that he had something there, you know. <laughs> but uh, he always had a drive, you know, a drive to be the best at what he what he did, and and when he, I think. You know, the, the, the thing about teaching is that when you're teaching, you're relearning. When you're teaching, you're conceptualizing. So all these things helped him as far as uh, becoming a better martial artist to the point where he was just getting amazingly good at it and being recognized for it, too. Can, can someone who's that master at, at such a masterful level really truly receive enlightened instruction from someone else? Well, there's been a, a, a few uh, people that said that they showed Bruce Lee what they could do, and Bruce Lee would try to mimic it, and, he said, and they said when he came back 
couple of days later, he would do it better than them. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it, it shows you, you know, how much time he must have put into it to get to that level in just a few days. You know, <laughs> so but so here you are. Here you are following his 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 pathway uh, mm-hmm. in real time as it's going on, and you're involved in martial arts. Talk about that that intersection and what that ultimately did to you and, and did to your whole way of thinking. I, I think um, one of the things that, I, you know, during the, my youth looking at Bruce Lee was that he was a person who emphasized his humanity instead of his culture, which meant that uh, he didn't, find any limitations for himself as far as being a Chinese man because he knew that the only limitation is that of a human being but not of a not of his culture so I think that that hit you know that hit well with me you know and I and I looked at that and I realized you know uh, it, it kind of sparked uh, an idea here that you know we, we it, it's very easy to be created by your environment but few people can you know, really go out and create themselves in spite of their environment, you know. And Bruce Lee did that, and I think he helped me do that, too. But but how did that change your way of thinking in in both the martial arts world and just in your interactions with people, your interactions with people? Uh, because I, for, for myself, I, I think... Uh, I knew that if I set my mind to something to try to accomplish it, I could do it uh, and not be limited to, like I said, my environment or my culture or whatever. You see, and, and I could put my mind to it and, and achieve it and just continue doing it. Uh, you know, that was a that was a big thing that I saw with Bruce Lee that he that he you know he, he had that discipline of mind and uh and i try to uh get that for myself and discipline the mind so that i can try to create goals and achieve them but but something tells me that was in you before this uh just just it seems like you had it it it, it might have been but i didn't have that, that guidance that i saw when i saw it with bruce okay you know, uh, you know, someone to point the way, I guess you could say, you know. So <clears throat> let's talk about Bruce's career. So he's doing the movies. You talked about Fist of Fury and, and, and Longstreet. What happens next in his journey? Um, well, it, 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 if you look at his whole life, his whole life is like a, a chain of events. And, you know, because one thing happened, the other thing happened, and the other thing happened because of that happened, and so forth. So, so you, 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 look at lot, you look at Bruce Lee and his whole life, and, and you realize, wow, if this didn't happen, the other thing wouldn't have happened, and that wouldn't happen. That would. so, so you look at it, and, and, and I myself like to put that puzzle together. I, you know, I, I have uh, so much material on Bruce Lee's life and all, a lot of, like I say, a pa- uh, paper trail. <laughs> of Bruce Lee's life, and I kind of put it all together to, to put the, the puzzle together. And, and you look at it and you realize, wow, you know, if his, the way things happened to him, you know, it, it was like uh, almost pre- predestined as you look at it. You know, it, it was so amazing. Uh, like, for example, he, he, he left Hong Kong, he came to America. He was in San Francisco and they went to Seattle to go to the to take remedial courses to finish his high school because remember he didn't finish high school in in Hong Kong, and then he entered the University of Washington, but and but during all that he he was being uh, asked by people to teach him kung fu and he started teaching to the point where, uh, you know, uh, when he first got to Seattle he was a busboy in a, in a restaurant, the restaurant was called Ruby Chow's it was a Chinese restaurant and here he is a busboy sweeping floors. Uh, washing dishes, and he's doing this at he's doing this uh, to so that he can uh, man, maintain his his apartment in the in the top part of the restaurant where he was living. So 
So uh, he was working as a busboy in that restaurant. And, and then when he goes to teach, you know, people are bowing to him and calling him Sifu, you know. It's just like a, it's like a two, two different worlds, you know. But uh, eventually what happened to him was that um, he opened up his own school. He opened up a school in Seattle and, and started teaching the art. And, uh, and then from there, he, more people got to know who he was. And he did a demonstration in, uh, in Long Beach, California. And uh, he was discovered for the role of Cato doing that. Right. You know? And then, then the movies. And then, I mean, how many movies did he do all together? Uh, I mean, roughly. Let's see. The, well, he was the big boss, the Fist of Fury. Way of the Dragon, The Game of Death, and Enter the Dragon. So he did five martial arts movies. And then uh, he did, he, he was in a movie called Marlowe with James Garner. That was, a, that was another movie. Uh, but then uh, you have to remember, he was also a child actor, so he did a, a lot of movies as a child. They weren't martial arts movies, obviously. Right, right. But, but he still got that experience of, of acting, you know. Uh, <laughs> And then in, on television, American television, he did the Green Hornet, and the Green Hornet. He also did. Uh, he was in an episode of Ironside, an episode of Here Come the Brides. So uh, and then Longstreet. So so he was still busy out there, you know, in movies. What what was television. what was his relationship with his parents? You know, because they, uh, they sent them to America. Mm -hmm. And in those days, it wasn't like you could do, you know, video calling from your cell phone or whatever um, to keep in touch. How did that work for him? And did his parents, you know, understand his meteoric success? I don't think his parents realized how good he was getting um, in martial arts. Uh, when he left, when he left Hong Kong, uh, he, his father gave him $100. He had $100 in his pocket when he arrived in, to, in San Francisco. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the relationship he had with his father was, was you know, in, 19, in 1940, 1959, when he was 18. His father was strict, you know, was a, a strict dad. And, and, you know, the mother was the soft one. The father was the, the tough one, you know. And... Uh, so I think uh, he probably, you know, uh, he did he did call them every now and then on the phone from Seattle to speak to them. And at that time, it was very expensive to do, you know, long distance phone calls. And uh, but they they sent him to America so he could make something of himself because he they knew if they, if he stayed in Hong Kong too long, he, he he'd be getting in trouble. You know, and they didn't know what what direction he would have gone. Do you have any of his letters between him and his parents? I don't think he wrote much letters to his parents. I think he called them on the phone. Got it. But I do have a lot of, of his letters, though. <laughs> right. That he wrote to a lot of people. So let's talk. You you basically have, in a sense, a Bruce Lee museum, right? I have a Bruce Lee museum, and I also have the paper trail of Bruce Lee's life. All right. So let's talk about the museum first. Okay. What 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 do you have in this museum, and 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 how? Do, and, and, and how, would, how did it develop? How did it start? Well, uh, back in 1973 was, you know, when Bruce Lee passed away. And a month later, his movie Enter the Dragon came out, which just blew everybody away seeing him there. I mean, that was, that was the movie for him, you know, a Hollywood-made movie for a martial arts. And... Uh, so, so uh, when that movie came out, at, he remember he passed away in July, and that movie came out in August of '73. Uh, that was it. Every, you know, uh, I wanted to know everything about Bruce Lee that I could. <laughs> you know, just so uh, you know, going to school, you would look at the newsstands, and if there was a magazine on Bruce Lee. You know, you buy it, and any book that came out on Bruce Lee would buy it. So I started buying magazines and books on Bruce Lee, and. Uh, and anything that I could find. Then, then in uh, 1975, Black Bill Magazine started advertising that they were going to write a book called The Tao of Jeet Kune Do, 
which was Bruce Lee's writings. Because another thing about Bruce Lee was that he did a lot of writing, especially about martial arts. He actually had close to 5,000 notes on it. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so so his notes were put into a book form. And uh, it was so... Uh, was, were his, at, was notes, I didn't mean to interrupt, but were his notes in uh, Chinese or was it in... Uh, English. English, okay. The majority, of, yeah, 99.9%. In okay. English, there were some Chinese writings too that needed to be translated, but mostly all in English. Okay, thanks. So uh, keep going. Yeah, yeah. Black Belt Magazine uh, started advertising that they were going to bring this book out. You know, uh, uh, the Dao Jikundo book in 1975. So uh, I asked my mother to write a check, you know, <laughs> and order it for me, you know, which she did. And every day I would check the mailbox to see when the book was coming in, you know. Meanwhile, I told my I told my uh, mom to get a get me a desk, get me a lamp, get me some a ruler, and I was getting ready for the book, you know. <laughs> and sure enough, it arrived in the in the mail. And I, when I opened up that envelope, it was like, you know, opening up the, the Dead Sea Scrolls or something. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. That yeah. kind that kind of reaction, you know. <laughs> and I remember just opening it up and just reading it and reading it and reading it until this day. I'm still reading it. And, and get something new out of it, you know. So uh, I, 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 I've been reading that Dao Jet Kundo book since 1975. And, uh, and I do it with my students now because they read it and they can't understand it. And I try to explain what it means and so forth because some, some of it can get a little heavy, you know. What, what, so, what do you learn today from that body of philosophy and insight? that you didn't really extract the first time around? Um, the philosophy or, or the book itself? Yeah, the, the, the content, you know, when, when, you read, when you read the words, is there something that jumps out to you that yeah, is different yes. now than it was back then? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I was looking at, uh, you know, Years ago, I was looking at the book, and and it's, and just a little sentence that says, "To be a successful fighter, and it says to say, mastering the proper fundamentals and the progressive application." You know, and and that was something that never popped out on me. You know, and when I looked at that, I started realizing, you know, well, let's find out what this progressive application is, and that was a whole journey to find out. And I did find out what it was. So, uh, and. Uh, and that was uh, that opened up a whole new world as far as the art was concerned, because basically he was talking about the strategy and tactics of the art. Now, so, which I teach to my students now. I definitely want to get into this whole. Uh, we have like two minutes. Let's talk for just a brief moment. We'll continue after the break about the artifacts and other things in the museum. So you started with like say magazines and this and that. But magazines, books, uh a lot of magazines, a lot of books. And then statues started coming out, so I would buy one and buy two <laughs> and then, you know, I realizing, you know, as as a collector you want you want to get uh things that are that are hard to collect and the Japan was going crazy creating Bruce Lee things and they actually did the soundtracks of the movies. Remember, this was before VHS. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. so you, you would contact somebody in Japan as a, what we call pen, uh, pen pals, you know, and, yeah. and ask him, could you send me the LP for the Fist of Fury, you know, and, and they say, all right, but can you send me the American version of this book? You know, and then you say, okay, we trade and, and then you get the, this LP and you play on your phone grab and, you hit, and you're listening to the movie, you know, I mean, stuff like that. It's just, it, it was an incredible time, you know. And that's how things, you know, continue growing and the collection continue growing. Uh, Until the point where I started getting personal things of Bruce Lee there, you know, because I got to meet Bruce Lee's wife. And, uh, and I helped her out with some of the... She, she wanted to keep Bruce Lee's art alive, so she wanted to do these conventions. And I helped her out, and and, uh, and with the convention, gave her a lot of ideas because I had done one before, uh, uh, 
with with Jeet Kune Do, the art, the seminar. I did a big seminar with and brought in like seven instructors and had over a hundred people come in the ten day event and we had different rooms and people would rotate and I mean it was a really big event. And she got word of it and she wanted to do the same thing. So I helped her out with that and in return she gave me all of Bruce Lee's business cards, this envelope, stuff like that. Just, that was amazing. All right. We'll be right back. Keep it locked here. We are back. All right. So in case you're just, just tuning in, especially if you just got in the car, we are with Sifu, Richard Torres, and Michael Malay. And we're talking about JKD, Bruce Lee, and martial arts and a whole cool things that have started in the 1940s and keep just going forward to today. So now we're talking about the collecting of the personal yeah. items of Bruce Lee. So we got, we got your start. So uh, Bruce's widow was nice enough to mm-hmm. give you some things. But then I have a feeling that the collection started to build further from there. So let's talk about that. Uh, yes. Uh, Bruce Lee also, in, in 1963, wrote a book called Chinese Kung Fu, The Philosophical Art of Self-Defense. And uh, he, there were only 500 copies made of that book. And uh, it was very tough to find, but I did get a, one of those copies. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and, uh, and I asked his wife, Linda, and his daughter, Shannon, to sign it for me. Oh, wow. You know, that, and, 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 you know, it, 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 it's always mind-boggling to me that I even met these people. I mean... I always tell the story of how I, I was just a young kid, you know, living in the in, in the Bronx, watching Bruce Lee in the movies, and saying one day I want to be able to do this art, and and you know now come here in 2020, and it's it's been done, you know, so it's amazing, amazing, amazing journey. All right, so, when did you meet the rest of the family members? Because you, um, you, you mentioned the daughter. Did he have any brothers or anything like that? That yes, he had. He had two brothers. One was Bruce Lee's brother. Was one was named as Peter, Peter Lee, and he was a he was a fencing champion. He did uh, the art of fencing, which Bruce Lee looked into for his art. And then his other brother, Robert Lee, he was more into the recording and singing uh, business. Uh, but I got to meet Bruce Lee's son, Brandon, who got shot by accident filming the, a movie called The Crow. But I got to meet him in 1990. Uh, I was invited to Bruce Lee's 50th birthday in California. Uh, you know, I live in New York, so I used to write a, a newsletter. You know, being a Bruce Lee uh, collector and doing the martial arts, I used to write a newsletter called The Bruce Lee Informer. And... uh and I got recognized by some of the people in California, some of Bruce Lee's uh, students. And they, I was invited to Bruce Lee's 50th birthday as a special guest. That's and, quite uh, an honor. I, yeah. And I, and I went there. And when I went there, uh was the first time that I ever met uh, Bruce Lee's wife, Linda Lee, and his, his son, Brandon Lee. You know, I met them both. So we took pictures and... They signed a few things, few things for me, but, but uh, also present were a lot of Bruce Lee's uh, original students and 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 people, some people from the Hollywood crowd. Uh, Van Williams, the Green Hornet himself, was there. Wow. Uh, yeah, uh, we had uh, people that that were involved in the in the in the movie industry. They were there, um, but I also met my instructor there. His name was uh, Ted Wong. I always call him Sifu Ted Wong. Okay. Uh, and I got to meet him there in 1990. And it's funny because uh, collecting books on Bruce Lee, you, you, if you recall, I said in 1975, I collected, I, I got the Dow of Jeet Kune Do book in the mail. But in 1976, one of Bruce Lee's leading students, uh, his name was Dan Santo, he wrote a book called Jeet Kune Do, the Philosophical Art. No, excuse me, Jeet Kune Do, the Bruce Lee's Philosophy. Ah. Uh, the Art Philosophy of Bruce Lee, that's the exact name. But uh, in that book, he mentions, you know, some of the people that Bruce Lee trained. And in that book, he, he talks about a guy named Ted Wong, who Bruce Lee taught from scratch, meaning that most of the students that Bruce Lee taught already had some martial arts experience, so it was easy for him to 
to teach them of what not to do than what to do, you know. Uh, whereas uh, Ted Wong never trained in any martial arts system, so Bruce Lee had to teach him from the ground up. From scratch. So I, yeah. So I said, uh, wow, this guy would be an amazing person to try to meet. So uh, I would always ask about him. In the 80s, I would meet other instructors, and I would ask them, you know, what about this Ted Wong? And they would all tell me the same thing. Oh, Ted Wong doesn't teach. He doesn't teach anybody, you know. I must have asked like three or four people, and they all, it's funny, they all gave me the same answer. He doesn't teach. But when I was invited to California in 1990, I did get to meet Ted Wong. You know, I saw him. He, actually, um, the day before the event, I was in a martial arts school uh, from one of the instructors that invited me. And then walks, it walks in Ted Wong, you know. And I recognized him right away, and I went up to him and said, you know, I've been searching for you since 1976. <laughs> you know, this is 14 years later, right? Or is, is my math right? 14 years, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and I said, by any chance, do you, you know, do you teach? Or you, you know, I need, I need you to be my instructor or something, you know. And he said, no, 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 I, I, I don't teach, you know. <laughs> But uh, he was very nice to me. But it's, it's funny because it's like that that old uh, story that you always see in those kung fu movies of the of the student seeking out the master, and then when he finds him, the master says, "You know, go away. I don't teach you or something like that." You know. <laughs> but uh, so it was almost a, 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 um, the same thing. But he did take my phone number, and I took his. And he gave me his phone number, and, and he told me well, if he ever starts to teach, he'll call me. And I did get that phone call. I got it in 1993, three years later. Wow. And he told me he was going to teach in Virginia. He was going to do a camp, a Jeet Kune Do camp. So, you know, got on the car and went over there, drove to Virginia from New York and saw him there. And that was it. From then on, we, we always we kept training together. And I stayed training with him for close to 19 years. Wow. Yeah. We even went to Europe together and did seminars together and so forth, so... It was amazing, and I got a lot out of it. You know, so, so it was great to learn this art from him. Besides my own research, you know. So, so at some point, it appears that you started your own school. Yes, I started. My, I opened up my school. Actually, you know, I I was always teaching. You know, since I, once I decided that I wanted to pursue the art of Jeet Kune Do, I stopped uh, going to the karate, to my father's jiu-jitsu, and to the kung fu, and I wanted to pursue the art of Jeet Kune Do. Obviously, there was no teacher there, but I already, you know, I already had some idea because I, could, I already knew how to kick, you know, punch and the throws and all that. So I, I had some martial arts background. But, uh, so, so I started teaching, I started teaching, uh, in a basement school in 75. And then from then on, I always had some type of a, a, a room that I was teaching. But formally, I opened up my school in, in Fishkill, New York. I opened it up in 1994. I know Fishkill and, very well. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. I, I used to work great, up there. Great place. Yeah. So yeah. we've been open for 26 years now. The school has been open. And we've been you know, teaching Bruce Lee's art there. What is the yeah. name of the school, and does it have a web address? Yeah, the name of the school is the Jeet Kune Do Martial Arts Institute. And, and, for, and, uh, and for those who may not be able to spell that, how do you spell that? <laughs> oh, J-E-E-T. Okay. Kune is K-U-N-E, and Do is D-O. Okay. Jeet Kune Do Martial Arts, M-A-R-T-I-A-L, Arts, A-R-T-S. Institute, right. and you can watch And then the website, yeah. The website is uh, www.jkdmartialarts.com. Ah, there you go. Mm-hmm. I will. We'll make sure that we put that underneath the uh, description of the show when we post this yeah, up on the, social media. JKD is the initials of Jikundo, so jkdmartialarts.com. All right. So That's maybe during pre-production, uh, you're explaining. What does Jeet Kune Do actually translate to? And, 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 and could you explain all of that to us? Yeah, uh, Jeet Kune Do translates, Jeet is intercepting, Kune is fist, and Do is way. And it basically means the way of the intercepting fist. Uh, 
The reason Bruce Lee came up with that is because after studying his brother's fencing books, he realized that uh, he could get a lot out of fencing to create his unique martial arts system. And one of the big things in fencing is called a stop hit. And Bruce Lee thought that was enlightening for, for himself because most arts teach you to attack and defend, but uh, with Jeet Kune Do, you learn to attack, defend, and intercept. So it's the, that third uh, that third ingredient there. And he got that from fencing. And fencing teaches the stop hit or the time hit. And Bruce Lee incorporated that into his martial arts where we have a stop kick or stop hit with the hand. So that's like, the that's right. the intercepting part. That's the intercepting part. Wow. Yes. And, and he thought it was very enlightening to add to his art. Yes. Okay. And the Jeet Kune Do is, is a um, Cantonese uh, phrase. Actually, the, the, the original name of the art was called the Dao, Dao of Jeet Kune, T-A-O. T-A is, is pronounced Dao. Okay. T-A-O. T-A-O is so it was the Dao of Jeet Kune. Dao is Wei in Cantonese. So Dao Jeet Kune would be Wei of intercepting fifth. But... Um, when he was going to be interviewed for Black Bill Magazine article back in uh, 1967, he, uh, he didn't think the art should be called the Tao of Jeet Kune because it sounded too philosophical. So he added Do at the end and took out the Tao in the beginning. So because Tao and Do actually mean the same thing. It means way. Got it. Tao is more uh, Chinese and Do is more Japanese. Because they sound the same, you know, Dao, Do. But, you know, when you have, if you look at the Japanese art, you have Aikido, Karate Do, Judo, and then Korea, Taekwondo. They all end with Do at the end. Ah. So he started naming, so he named the art, instead of Dao Jeet Kune, he called it Jeet Kune Do. So what, to, to what extent did you have to learn the different Asian languages to understand the martial art better, if any? Uh, not much. There are some terminologies that we do use uh, for certain techniques that that are, you know, come from the Asian terminologies, whether they're Chinese or Japanese. But not much. You know, basically the, you know, the, the art was founded here in America too. You have to understand. You know, Bruce Lee was here in, in the in the states, and uh, it, it's important to know too that Bruce Lee was in the states for only twelve years. And in those 12 years, he accomplished quite a lot. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he just did so much. He opened up his own martial arts school, created his own martial arts system, got married, had two kids, uh, starred in a, in a TV series, rubbed elbows with a Hollywood crowd. Uh, I mean, just... And, and, and collected close to 2,000 books, which that in itself is, is an amazing thing. So let's uh, let's talk about the Bruce Lee Library. You, we talked yeah. about this in pre-production. Let, yeah, you, you told me that he had an extensive library. Yes, whenever he wanted to learn about anything, and I think I think it came about because if you remember what I mentioned before, back in uh, 1959, 1960, when he 60 when he started teaching kung fu, he used to go to Vancouver, to the Chinatown there, Vancouver, Canada, from Seattle and go to the Chinatown there and, uh, and buy books on Kung Fu. So I think he realized that books were a good source of information, you know. So uh, he started collecting books and, and devouring them, reading them to learn, you know, whatever, you know, whatever interests him. And, and, you know, he, he actually got into a real fight in Oakland in 1964, and he started buying books on boxing, you know, so, to learn about the art of boxing. So, so he was constantly, constantly buying books. And I always, and I always say, you know, he had close to 2,000 books. So those books allow you to see the, 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 the journey, the path that he took as far as learning is concerned. And, and those books became his, his instructors, basically, you know. It's not like today that we, you know, we Google everything and we can go to YouTube and learn. And that's it. And we learned it from there. But there's no, there's no trail for anyone to know, you know, where you got your information from. Whereas with Bruce Lee, because there was no computers, he, he actually would purchase the books and learn from those books. And we got to see, you know, uh, 
which books he had in his library to know, you know, what path he took as far as learning was concerned. And where's that library today? His daughter uh, has it. You know, she owns she owns the the Bruce Lee Enterprises, so she has all his books. She has basically everything. She has his books. She has his writings. Everything that exists, uh, and she runs, you know, the Bruce Lee Enterprises. Basically, uh, if you go to BruceLee.com, you can see everything that she has out there now. As far as she even has a shop where she sells things wow. on Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. In the three minutes we have left, okay. is there anything I didn't cover that you're yearning to tell us? Or that I didn't, <laughs> that I didn't, that I didn't know enough to ask? Um, e either about your school, your philosophy, your insights, your collection what you're looking to collect further, anything at all? Well, you know, uh, one of the things that I did do was, because I learned, I, I saw, I got a list of the books that were in Bruce Lee's library, I also started searching for those books, which wasn't easy, you know, but because of computers, we can do it. And I, you know, out of print books, basically. And I was able to build up my own library, uh, which I have an extensive library, you know, uh, uh, from ceiling to floor books myself. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and I guess having Bruce Lee as an example, and you see how, how he delved into books. I, I did the same thing and started reading and learning and self-learning, you know, because you never stop learning. You know, you graduate from college, but you have to continue, you know, teaching yourself whatever subject you want to learn. You see? Is, is, so, there a, uh, is there a book in you for us? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm actually working. I'm, I'm actually kidding. working on I'm working on two books actually. One is Bruce Lee's Life, and one is the other one is on Jeet Kune Do. And I'm working on them at the same time, so, but uh, I do have two that I'm working on. Well, then I'm gonna have yeah. to make sure that of all the different media people that seek you out, um, you know, when the book tour and all those other things unfold, that you remember us humble little folk <laughs> on the radio <laughs> here uh, as the first. You know, I'm not saying exclusive, I'm just saying the first. <laughs> because, of course. you know, of course. because we, 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 you know, at least with, with my show, I always try to make people uh, really talk about their passions in, in, as, mm -hmm. in, as, in as much depth as possible. Um, yes. And you've certainly done that today. We only have like oh, 50 seconds left. I'll tell you, I know an hour is an hour is an hour, but sometimes it's a fast hour. And what you've enlightened us with has been truly special. What you do oh, is you. truly unique and important. And, uh, you know, we could all learn from a lot of what you teach, both spiritually and physically. And I do have to thank Michael for putting this all together. And uh, well, thank you, Mike. You, you know, really, thank you for that. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot. And, um, you know, just real fast, uh, the website is? www.jkdmartialarts.com. All right. I thank you both. You Richard, are... before, we, before we break, just to tell you that, in my opinion, Sifu Torres' JKD teachings are evolutionary. They started with Bruce Lee. He's added his own special sauce. And like anything that is great, there's always an evolutionary point that someone who is also a master can bring things forward to. I believe Sifu Torres does that very elegantly. All right. Well, that will end it. See everybody next time. Thank you for listening.